I want to relate what I was just saying about that kind of use of infinity to a, a nice little observation about that you can think of in just like an algebra two or, or basic calculus setting. If you look at a, um, a rational function, polynomial over polynomial, um, or even um, also like things like sin, or let's say a tangent, secant, cotangent, and cosecant, things that have vertical asymptotes very often, um, you, you more likely than not notice the following kind of behavior at an asymptote. Um, you often see, let's say with vertical asymptotes, you often see that maybe it's a, an up asymptote on one side, and more often than not, it's a down asymptote on the other side. Not always, but it's common. It's kind of more common to have that happen. And then maybe this goes up again, and then you see it coming back from the other direction. Um, and why is that? Well, um, it's because, and so it's, it's a cool thing, if let's look at, let's, let's think about that as going off to infinity in this way where the values, let's look at a real line, the values are going up, 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 and they tend to want to just wrap around using that point at infinity. Remember that circle model? They tend to want to wrap around and just keep going in the same direction. Now, they could bounce, but let's see what happens when, when what happens when we just take look at one over that kind of function. That kind of asymptote, when we look at it in the other chart, the other coordinate system, by just taking one over it, that's going to look just like something going to zero from the positive numbers, one over a big positive is positive, then going through zero as if nothing is wrong, and then coming out the other side. That's the more typical intersection of a curve with the x-axis. And when you take the reciprocal of that, you get this kind of picture. Okay, um, So you don't really have to talk about points in infinity at all to talk about this, but but it's kind of cool to think about this wrapping around via the point at infinity and coming back and just kind of going in the same way. If you want to be more technical and correct about it, you just say, look, why did I get this thing? Like if it's tangent or secant or cotangent or anything, it's because I took one over something. And if what I took one over of was what's called a transverse intersection of the, of the axis, I'm going to get this up behavior and then down on the other side. Well, when would I get up, up, for example? Oh, that's when it's the reciprocal of positive and then tangent and then positive. That's quite special. That kind of non-transverse intersection, like a double zero for like a polynomial or something, that's much more special, much more sensitive, and it has to just work just exactly right to be exactly tangent. And that's where you get like one over this guy is going to be this guy. So for example, of course, the two basic examples are f of x is one over x has the down up asymptote, whereas f of x is one over x squared that's the simplest example of an up-up asymptote. And exactly, this is the reciprocal of a transverse intersection. This is the reciprocal of a tangent intersection. Similarly, um, for horizontal asymptotes of these guys, if it has one, if this has a horizontal asymptote, that's going to be where the degree of P and Q are equal, then most commonly, you're going to have it coming like maybe up to that horizontal asymptote over here, and if it's like a nice algebraic function, and it's like what we were just talking about, um, it's going to come, uh, it's going to be like that on the other side. And so it's going to sort of cross. So again, in terms of now in terms of the input space, it's you're walking along that circle and coming back around and just kind of saying, la, 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 I'm going to go up, I'm going to go through the asymptote value when I'm at the point in infinity, say here, and then just kind of walk through it and keep going in the same direction. Bouncing off and turning around in the unit circle model would be like that. And that's just a little more special. It's like a, a second order or an even order kind of uh, behavior. Anyway, that's kind of a cool thing that makes you think about that in a new way. So let me just talk um, mainly about the something that's really tempting to talk about in the context I've already said, and that is uh, the projective plane and projective geometry. I've mentioned this in other videos, like I went into it in some detail in the video series I did that was talking about um, the Hodge conjecture. Um, but it's, it's a huge thing, and I should make more videos about this particular topic. So projective geometry in general is really cool, and the projective plane is the simplest place where it starts. And very, very briefly, when we have two parallel lines, 
the classical description of parallel lines is they do not meet, but it can be really, really useful to invent a point where they meet, and the only reasonable point where parallel lines could meet is off at infinity. And so we say we're going to invent a place for those parallel lines they're going to meet at at infinity. Well, this is a little different from what we were doing before, although it's related to the Riemann sphere stuff. Um, because in fact, we're going to add up many, many points at infinity. If you have different parallel, a, a different pair of parallel lines, oh, um, they meet at infinity, you might be like, well, what about over here? As usual, do, 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 do. That's the same infinity. So if you walk along here, eventually the railroad tracks will merge. This is like that picture of like railroad tracks seeming to merge. <clears throat> um, and so it has a lot to do with perspective as well as projection. So they'll merge over here, and then, event, and then immediately you can kind of teleport over to here and come back this way. But these parallel lines, if they're going in a genuinely different direction, they will have their own point at infinity. And I'll call it infinity prime. It's not the official notation, though. That's another point at infinity. These are the same one, these two are the same as each other, these two are the same as each other, but these guys are different. Um, and to every direction, basically, meaning, I guess, pair of directions, every line, every direction for a line, not a ray, you add a new point at infinity to the, to, um, to the plane. And that's pretty cool. Um, there's another thing, there's a, a version of that that's kind of like the stereo, stereographic projection circle model. For to a topologist, they don't care about like infinite and like and and um, length and things being super infinitely long. They just talk care about the, sort of the connectivity of everything. And one way to implement this is really cool. You take our good old friend the sphere, and um, the shell of the sphere, not the not the the bulk. You take the sphere, and then you identify, you glue together any pair of opposite points on the sphere. And you say that if I'm here, it's the same as, as being here. They're the same exact point. Pretty freaky, but it's it's really a lot like saying two-thirds is four-sixths. When you first tell that to somebody, they might be like, whoa, how could those be the same? They don't look the same. Well, they're the same number. They just look the same. They just look different. So it's a similar kind of thing. Um, and let me just very quickly relate that to a plane with points added. If you've got this sphere and you're identifying points that are antipodal, opposite to each other, you really don't need almost any of the bottom hemisphere because they're already represented by points up here. So I'm going to say, well, a slightly less elegant way to do it is to say take the whole top of the dit, that, that top hemisphere, including the boundary, because you do need equator points, um, and again, identify any antipodal points. Well, there's not that many antipodal pairs left. It's just the ones on the boundary. Okay. And then I can flatten that down to a topologist. All that matters is, you know, how many holes and how things are connected. And so it's like um, a disk in here, and you've got points, special points on the boundary that are identified in pairs. Turns out that to a topologist, that's exactly what the geometer was talking about. A bunch of normal points, that's the interior, plus points at infinity that are naturally accessible if you go off this direction. You get to this point, and then you can immediately teleport because that's the same point and come back this way. Okay. Um, to a geometer, though, those to a topologist, what you're adding is a circle's worth of points. To a geometer, they really actually describe it. Um, it has the, all the properties of a line. It turns out that if you think about it more geometrically, what you've added is actually a line at infinity. I know I'm going really fast. I'm not trying to teach you projective geometry. It's trying to have some freaky, freaky cool stuff about infinity. It actually adds a line at infinity. And again, the two second version of why would you do this? This is just trippy. Why is this not just fake? One very small part, it's such a big subject, is that you get these state statements with no exceptions. Two points determine a line. That's something that's true in ordinary geometry. And two lines determine by intersecting a point. That does have exceptions in ordinary geometry, namely two lines. Two parallel lines don't intersect and determine a point, but now they do. And there's a beautiful duality in this theory 
that any statement involving points and lines, it turns out in projective geometry, you can exchange the word point for line and you'll get a true theorem. That's pretty cool. And you have to add this stuff at infinity in order for that to work. More generally, there's things like projective three-dimensional space. Um, so you can, you can projectivize like R3 or Rn or C or Cn. Um, it turns out if you projectivize C, you actually get, this is the connection I alluded to, you actually get the Riemann sphere. So the Riemann sphere is also called the projective complex line because the algebraists are weird and they think of it like a line. Slightly long story. Okay. So there's all kinds of take it, ways of taking fairly ordinary spaces and adding these points at infinity in a way that is totally satisfying to the topologist and the geometer um, and, and the, the analyst. Somebody thinks about uh, smooth functions and derivatives. Uh, there's an A there. Um, they love it too. They're really just wonderful spaces. A lot of people work uh, in project. A lot of mathematicians work in projective space. Um, and there, all of these things I've been doing in this video and the previous video are species of what's, as I said, what's called compactifications. Adding points to a space where you could run off to infinity to kind of give places to run off to. And once you add enough of those, you actually just can't run off anywhere, anywhere else. You don't have any honest infinities, any things where you just blah, 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 go off and blah, off and off and it gets complicated, okay? Um, it's related to a slightly different thing, but called completions, completing your space. So algebraic geometers talk about completing their space and and um, topologists talk about compactifying, but they're, they're, they're pretty closely related. Um, so um, last example would be back to a very basic use of infinity, which I you might have wondered I didn't mention, we can look at sequences and limits of sequences. And you could say, hey, what's what about the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n? Like if you're looking at you know the, the limit of a sequence or like the sum of a series or something like that, it's based on this very basic notion of, of letting a, an integer variable go off to infinity. Well, you can compactify the integers Here's the integers. I had a, a, a topologist teacher who said, well, sometimes I teach number theory and my algebraist friends are really freaked out when I say, here's the integers and I draw a bunch of dots. And they're like, ah, you're such a topologist. You, this is all about algebra, numbers and divisibility and stuff. It's not about dots, but he thought that way. Well, it turns out it's a good way to think sometimes. You can look at the, these dots that are the, the integers and you think about sequences as assigning a value, a real number to each dot, like this sequence. And then we want to know does that have some some nice limit? Say the limit of those values as n goes to infinity is equal to L. Well, turns out totally makes sense to add one exactly one point at infinity, and say okay if this is true and you want you got to use the usual careful definitions. If that's true, it makes sense to say okay, a sub infinity equals L. I just add one more value to the sequence as a nice little shorthand um, for for being L. And the one of the cool things here is that um, you can put a natural notion of what it means to be a continuous function from this space, the, the extended natural numbers, so that would be like n sub infinity, to the real numbers. And usually when I have a space like this that's all these discrete pieces, saying that a function from this to the real numbers is continuous doesn't say anything because I can't really take that zero and kind of move it really, really close to the one. They're just different. But it turns out if you use the right notion of what continuity means, the right topology basically on this space, saying that this function, this sequence A is continuous exactly says that the limit really does exist and is equal to L and you did it carefully. So it's kind of a cool thing that continuity on a bigger space is a shorthand for limit on a, a slightly smaller space. Um, very typical thing with compactification. Turns out there's another kind of compactification on the integers where you don't just add one point at infinity, you add an uncountable number of points at infinity, kind of saying, hey, I can walk, I don't have to walk in this one direction always, I can walk around this set in all kinds of arbitrary complicated ways and then see what happens to the limit of my sequence. That's a really complicated subject. If you want to look it up, it goes by the name of uh, stone check compactification. 
it's pretty trippy. It's really cool. Um, and it relates to things like ultra filters. And you might have heard perhaps of um, uh, things like non standard arithmetic. Okay. So, which brings me to, I want to end this. Um, these were not meant to be super long. Um, notions of infinity that I'm not going to touch on right now in this little series. Um, well, things like this, notions of, like non-standard arithmetic and somewhat similar concepts called the surreal numbers. Those have notions of infinite quantities and infinitesimal quantities, which are outside the scope of what I've been talking about here. It's more set theory type, type things, funky stuff, useful, but usually in a specialized way. Okay, so that's really cool stuff. Maybe I'll add to this at some point with those. And then there's always, um, if I look at sets that just happen to have an infinite number of elements in them, infinite sets, and the different sizes of infinity. And there's two ways of talking about that. There's cardinality, where you don't put an order on them, and ordinality, where you do. But I've already made videos, some basic videos about what that's about. And so this is this is a very, very different use of different ways of thinking about infinity. Okay, that's all I wanted to say.